medical school and has an ability to join us. And so it's great to see you here, Kevin, today. I, I, Kevin is an outstanding MS4 at Rush who has a great podcast of his own. But I also got to meet another medical student over Twitter, Marcus Wright, who um, is actually an MS2 and um, still has the bandwidth and the time to join us today. So hi, Marcus. Thank you for hanging out. And thank you for your um, terrific tweet about shock, which is relevant here. I think that whenever you're dealing with a chest complaint and the patient loses consciousness, um, the 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 connection between the um, the heart, uh, the connection between the chest and the brain is primarily through plumbing, and I think that's the that's the analysis by which we have to go through the the background is to say there's been three months of dyspnea to layer on to Reza's analysis of of the foreground and we don't want to spend too much time on the background because the foreground is so much more acute. So you spend two seconds and you make some leaps that you may have to re-examine later. And the leaps are to say that there's dyspnea and orthopnea. So that equals heart failure. The truth is that's not true. Um, there are other causes of orthopnea. And we haven't clarified that the reason he needs to sleep on three pillows is because it helps his dyspnea. So there's a lot of assumptions there. But if you layer on orthopnea, you're saying that this person has con congestive heart failure. And the clue in the foreground is there appears to be some sort of vascular phenomenon, which is inferred, again, not, not concluded, um, but inferred based on the fact that there is loss of consciousness and it's abrupt. And so the key question is what kind of vascular heart failure syndromes exist? And the most common is coronary artery disease. That doesn't necessarily explain the um, problem that results in brain hypoperfusion absent a massive myocardial infarction. So here my mind goes to chronic pulmonary artery diseases and chronic aortic diseases as a leap to connect to the plumbing that connects to the brain. And so I think if you're prioritizing um, one of the, the, I think that's the key question now is um, I'm worried enough about chronic pulmonary and chronic aortic diseases. And so what would I do practically? No matter what, even if you show me an EKG with ST elevation and reciprocal depression, we, I think we need to get a CTA with contrast for this patient. Why? Even if they have ACS, the possibility of it extending from an aortic dissection is too high um, in a patient with this background. So the actionable step with this history is to get vessel imaging no matter what you see on your preliminary data. Any thoughts on that, Prof. Rez? Those are quite some leaps, I think. They're, maybe they'll be incorrect because there are a lot of assumptions along the way, but I think the tube of truth awaits this human being. Robbie, I love that. And I, and I also love um, Rebecca's comment about possible pneumothorax when you're given sudden on. And again, it goes back to perforation and, and hypoperfusion, but then the background is maybe a little more challenging unless there's some chronic pulmonary parenchymal disease that then suddenly ruptured and caused that. But I, I love that additional thought. Thank you, Rebecca. Okay, then for review of systems, he also complains of a chronic dry cough since two years with sometimes he has red sputum that's coming that he's coughing up and he has also four kilograms of weight loss within the last three months he has no allergies takes no medications does not smoke does not drink or and also denies illegal substance abuse so no drugs um, he is not sexually active has not traveled recently he lives on a farm um, is a student and he plays american football yes and if you want to know he's throwing the disc he's also throwing discus i don't know how to say that um, that's also something he does and he has, for his family history, he has a grand aunt who had a pulmonary embolism at 40 years, otherwise unremarkable. I don't know if you want to comment on that or I can give you the physical examination. You know, I'll just comment on it briefly and then have a Prof. Rez digest the exam when, when you present it. And I think that, um, you know, the background data in these instances is usually held in your back pocket until the foreground is clarified. And uh, just to be specific, PE is such a common diagnosis, unfortunately, that, that a positive family history is not unheard of. And so here is hard not to increase the probability of PE based on the fact, but it's so common that it easily could be an innocent bystander. 
I think more intriguing um, is the combination of when you say dry cough and farm exposure. Um, the truth is most people who live on farms don't have coxiella or brucella, but that combination certainly should make you think of it. Um, the most intriguing of all is the fact that there is weight loss. So there's a combination of dyspnea, orthopnea, and weight loss, and that um, prioritizes a, an inflammatory heart failure syndrome, which usually lands you most commonly in the pericardium, with pericardial disease being a common site of inflammation that results in weight loss and also heart failure. The other common site is actually the pulmonary artery. So there's a lot of autoimmune and infectious conditions that affect the pulmonary artery that we'll have to consider here. And the pulmonary artery is an elegant uh, localization because pulmonary artery dilation is a notorious cause of cryptic cough um, that can't be because uh, of compression on the airways and of low-grade hemoptysis. Um, but there are other conditions that are inflammatory causes of weight loss. The most notorious on BMR is endocarditis, myocarditis, hyperthyroidism, thiamine deficiency, of course, are, um, are other considerations too. So um, all this, all these things are corner pieces in the puzzle. At the end of the day, the center image may or may not depend on these corner pieces and they may not be critical. But should the syndrome gain more clarity, if you give us a white count or you give us cavitary lesion, then his farm may be back in the spotlight. Um, if there is mediastinal widening on the x-ray, then we'll go back to the pulmonary and aortic hypotheses. So all these things are for you to use later. Don't lose sight of them, um, but don't pin them as a centerpiece in your picture. We'll see where, um, where the is an exam and then more data takes us. All right, Sammy, to you, my friend. Okay, nice discussion. So for the physical examination, he was um, in respiratory distress. His SpO2 was 88% under room air. Um, for the other vitals, his temperature was 36.7. His heart rate was 110 per minute. His um, BP was 101 over 67, and his respiratory rate was 24 per minute. His BMI, BMI was 19. For the HEAT exam, was basically unremarkable, no conjunctival icterus, no pharyngeal erythema, no cervical lymphadenopathy. Um, for his cardiovascular exam, he was rhythmic, um, tachycardic, no murmurs, rubs or gallops. His JVD was not elevated on the physical examination. For his pulmonary exam, he had, basic, basic, he had normal breath sounds. He was cleared auscultation bilaterally. And his abdominal exam, skin and neurologic exam was basically unremarkable. Um, I have an ECG. I don't know if you want to. Um... Can you repeat um, for the cardio exam um, and the heart rate? I don't think I got if they were tachycardic or not. So, sorry, I can't. I'm just writing, reading it from the PC, so I don't know how. Um... Oh, you're fine. I just want to make sure. He's rhythmic, tachycardic, and otherwise it's unremarkable. And his JVD What was his heart rate? Tachycardic, just uh, it wasn't given. Oh, on the physical exam, it was 110 per minute. Okay. I don't know, you want to... Demi, what do you I, think? Should we look at the EKG or do you want me to... Yeah, comment? I want you to comment on it. Yeah. So I don't know if I can share. No, I can't. As Sammy is pulling up, let me make Sammy co-host. As Sammy is pulling up the EKG, I'm going to just comment on this exam. The exam is so helpful. This patient is hypoxemic and in respiratory stress with a normal pulmonary exam. So when someone is hypoxemic, you want to one prove that they're truly hypoxemic. And in this case, they are hypoxemic. You already want to get an arterial blood gas. You want to get an EKG. You want to get a chest x-ray. These three are just right off the bat reflexes. You don't even need to think about it. Once you have hypoxemia, you listen to the lungs. If the lungs sing, then you know you're dealing with some kind of parenchymal or pleural process, like a pneumonia, like a pleural effusion. But what if the lungs are silent? Now you have to think about 
some kind of vascular process or some kind of shunt that might be happening. A vascular process could be like pulmonary embolism. A shunt could be, you know, something within the heart, intracardiac or intrapulmonary. But you just have to be cautious there because who would ever rely completely on their physical exam? Not me. So I do this with a grain of salt, meaning I need the image first before I label this as image negative hypoxemia, meaning chest x-ray negative hypoxemia. So that's sort of my approach to hypoxemia is whether it's from the lungs, um, you know, like actual pathology within the lungs, or if it's some kind of vascular issue. Uh, that being said, maybe we can get this EKG up on the whiteboard. Now you got to move quickly here, guys. This patient uh, is young, has a lot of reserve, is tacky, which is um, extremely uh, concerning. And maybe, Robbie, if you don't mind, I'll just comment on this and then you comment on it too, okay? And I love uh, the, the quick and dirty approach. So yes, you always want to be as systematic as possible, but I'm not going to do that here. I'm going to read it like I'm an emergency medicine um, provider named Robbie Jiha. The first thing you got to do is like zoom out from 30,000 feet and say, is it um, narrow or wide? Here it's narrow. Is it fast or slow? Here it looks like it could be going fast, so tachycardic. Is it regular or irregular? It looks pretty regular here. And then you can quickly look at the uh, lead two and you can see these nice P waves. So you know you're dealing with sinus tachycardia. So now let's go to the money. Are there any SC segment elevations or depressions or any T wave abnormalities? One of the most important things that I think we need to practice is identifying the isoelectric line. Because once you identify the isoelectric line, you can see if there's deviations in the ST segment or the PR segment. And the way to do that, to identify the isoelectric line, I take like a clear paper and I literally, I'm putting it on the screen right now. I'm putting it at the PR, okay? So at the PR segment, that's the isoelectric line. And then I see, is there any kind of changes above that? And here it's like very striking when you see these um, precordial uh, leads from V1, two, three, and four. You can see market T wave inversions, right? Market e T wave inversion. Although that's striking, you want to make sure you examine every other lead. So in lead three, you also have a T wave inversion. In AVF, you have subtle SC segment elevation. And even this precordial leads, when I look at it, you're almost getting a biphasic sort of T wave pattern there in the, in the precordial leads. So what I do with this, you can think of a couple of things. One, with these deep T wave inversions, could this be well inside where you have a proximal left coronary lesion? Not rupture, but proximal left. It's just so unusual in this young patient. Sometimes when you have intracranial catastrophe, you can get T wave inversions, but there's no neurologic deficits in this patient. And sometimes when you have intra-abdominal pathology, that's catastrophic, you can get T wave inversions. So I will um, leave it at that and pass the mic to, to Robbie to add more, because I don't feel very confident in EKG reading. Uh, Prof Rez, um, I'll, I'll be very transparent with you. I think that like, I think what you just did, just to name it publicly, is like you analyzed it, analyzed it, then a pattern came out to you and you used the word Wellens. And honestly, I think that's the uh, operating, like um, you should probably look at this and think Wellens and then have a DDX for Wellens. So you said Wellens and then you shared with us, oh, okay, my DDX for Wellens is intracranial hemorrhage, intracranial disease and catastrophe. And you know, I have kind of a deja vu feeling sometimes with, with things on VMR because it happened, it, ha it actually happened on RLR when you presented to me a case of diabetes two hours after Shema had emailed me a schema and having that deja vu again, because I've been trying to practice EKGs and this is literally a note that I made today. I'm going to share it with you. Literally this morning, watch this. I was Wellens, DDX, I should add intracranial, I didn't have it. And I, and I hey, look at this, caution. Deep precordial T wave inversion plus D wave inversion in three more suggestive of TMA. <laughs> <laughs> I want to pull up that EKG? <laughs> it's unreal. I just don't get it. Anyway, 
there's a so I think I don't I think you need a cardiologist because both are life threatening. But I think what you said in the beginning is true. We really worry about this patient and you can't cath this patient, but you can scan them for CT. Um, I have to read more, as you saw in my note, I actually just made a note uh, to read more about PE with T-wave inversion. But I think this is a Wellens pattern, but the caution is that there is a T-wave inversions in lead three. I don't know how good that is, um, but it makes me worry about pulmonary embolism or acute on chronic pulmonary hypertension, um, which is a pearl, which is like, Basically, if you interpret this EKG in the context of what Reza said about the exam, which is this is hypoxemia with clear lungs, I think all roads lead to the CT scanner. But, you know, I don't know enough about this um, space that I probably would also, in real life, call a cardiology fellow and say, hey, is this Wellens? Um, because as Reza said, both hypotheses that we're mentioning now are very, very morbid. All right, Sammy, Mike, to you. Okay. Um, but really so, quickly, Sammy, uh, Robbie, where did this come up? Which case did, did you encounter this? No. So um, Kirtan has been sending me cases <laughs> and a plug for two, if you want to get quick EKG reps, a plug for two uh, journals, which you may or may not have access to. Unfortunately, both of them are behind a paywall. JAMA Internal Medicine has brief EKG cases, and so does circulation. So this, this case came from um, one of the two. I forget which one. They're like literally like less than a page EKG pearl. And then you move on. Okay. Um, for his initial, so they also interpreted it as signs of acute right heart strain. There was no mention of Wellen syndrome or but they interpreted it as signs of acute right heart strain. For his initial labs, his leukocytes were 8,100 with a normal differential. Um, hemoglobin was 15.5, platelets 288. And leukocytes were 8,100 with a normal differential. Sodium was 139. Potassium was 4.2. Chloride was 105. Bicarb was 24. Creatinine 0 0.9. BUN was 20. AST was 25, ALT was 81, and alumin was 3.3. So he immediately received a CTA, as Robbie suggested. Um, in the right lower lobe and left upper lobe, So he basically had multiple pulmonary embolisms, just frame it like that. Um, the chest with free lung fields. And after that, he immediately received heparin and um, read the place. So fibronolytics. Um, Sammy, this is very intriguing. And just to clarify, so his CT shows no chronic findings, just acute multiple pulmonary emboli. Is that right? Yeah, it showed multiple pulmonary embolisms in the right and left lobes and one non-occlusive thrombus in the left lower lobe and prominent pulmonary arteries. So prominent. it wasn't mentioned if it's, yes, it okay. wasn't mentioned. Right. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. I thought, uh, um, I think my mine or your video, one of them was choppy. So um, I'm glad we have it on the whiteboard. Um, I'll just actually analyze the data, the labs here and pass the mic to Prof. Rest to analyze the imaging findings. And you might think that the data is actually not unhelpful. And, and honestly, I would too, if we weren't in kind of practice mode and clinical reasoning. And the reason it's helpful is because um, while most cardiopulmonary diseases are diseases that are diagnosed by pictures, either EKGs or CTs, there is a laboratory signature. 
And for example, you might look at the hemoglobin and say that this, the lack of polycythemia here makes a chronic hypoxemic condition less likely. So the fact that his hemoglobin is normal tells us that the three months that he's been sitting there coughing, he probably isn't hypoxemic that whole time. Um, which just to just to emphasize that aligns well with the condition in a pulmonary artery because it's pre-oxygen exchange. And similarly, if you're analyzing a chronic respiratory condition, especially a chronic cough, it's not uncommon for the disease to localize in the airways. And those airway diseases result in hypercarbia and that hypercarbia is shown in the renal panel with um, compensatory metabolic alkalosis, namely a rise in the CO2. So honestly, if you're looking at a chronic um, respiratory, chronic dyspnea, the labs actually, unlike acute dyspnea, with the exception of anemia, the labs can be helpful in a normal hemoglobin and normal CO2, either move you away from a cardiopulmonary disease period or support the notion that there is a pre-pulmonary cardiovascular disease process here. All right, Prof. Rez, Mike, to you. Hi, my friend. Um, I think it's really interesting if you go back on the journey of this case, meaning even from the first line, that theory of hyperacute really does prioritize obstruction, perforation, dissection, right at line one. And I think Robbie said something that was really important where you could look at that review of systems and be like, whoa, chronic cough, red sputum, this has to be a, a parenchymal process and has to have some kind of chronic component to it, but it may just be noise. It may just be noise. And we know with pulmonary embolism, you could eventually develop chronic thromboembolic disease, which can then lead to pulmonary hypertension. But, but we're not there yet because unlike the left side of the system, which is going up against such high pressure, so it takes time for there to be change, to the left side of the system, the right side is going against low pressures. So an acute PE can cause the vessel to dilate. So the dilation of the pulmonary artery can't be a clue to a chronic. It can be very consistent with an acute PE as could the RV dilation. And so we have to entertain this possibility of just acute pulmonary embolism. So that becomes the clinical syndrome here. And <clears throat> now we have to do a few things. I know we're a group of diagnosticians, <clears throat> but management is critical. So the first thing you do with a PE is you have to risk stratify it as massive or intermediate or you know, non-submassive, non-massive. So massive, submassive, or other. I like to think about it high risk, intermediate risk, low risk. The high risk is when someone is hypotensive with PE. That's not the case here. You just have to be cautious with this blood pressure. If it was an elderly patient with a history of hypertension, this actually may be pointing you towards massive pulmonary embolism. This is a very important pearl that you can't risk stratify a PE based on the imaging findings. You can have a clot that big. If the blood pressure is normal, it's not massive. So don't correlate or risk stratify based on the degree of clot. Right here, I'll tell you right away with that dilated pulmonary artery, we'll see what the echo shows, but I'm, I'm leaning towards submassive or intermediate risk pulmonary embolism. This affects management. So management wise, you get a, the way you can determine if something's intermediate risk is you can look at the cardiac enzymes, troponin and BNP. They have a poor prognosis. When that RV stretches, it releases BNP or when the heart is going up against the new pressure, the RV is going up against a higher pressure, you might release a troponin. So when you have those elevated, you're dealing with intermediate risk. The EKG, if it shows right heart strain, probably dealing with intermediate risk. The CT scan might show the RV is dilated or the pulmonary artery is dilated. Again, putting you up towards intermediate risk from low risk pulmonary embolism. Um, so the, and the final thing you can do is an echo. So what we need from Sammy right now is a troponin, a BNP, an echocardiogram uh, to help further risk stratify. And at the same time, if your institution has this, not every institution has this, you have to ask the question, does this patient need thrombolytic therapy or not, right? Because when you're treating a pulmonary embolism, yes, you want to anticoagulate, allow the body to break up the clot. However, some patients in that intermediate risk group benefit from either local or even systemic 
thrombolytic or even catheter guided thrombolytic therapy. So in this case, um, if you're at an institution which has a pulmonary embolism attack team, they would be activated. They would be activated to review this case to see if this patient's a candidate for thrombolytic therapy. And if you're high risk PE, meaning you have hypotension, you got to get thrombolytic therapy. There is one study that showed all patients who didn't ended up dying. So I'm putting this patient intermediate risk. Now the next question is why a PE? If you read a recent, like recent being two or three years ago, they say never work up a new clot, but not in this case. This is a 17 year old patient. So you gotta be cautious how you apply these review articles. You better work up a, a why this patient has a clot. There you can just simply start with the framework of Virchow's triad. Was there any immobility? No. Was there any trauma or any surgery? No. So now we're in the bucket of what causes hypercoagulability. And here um, with the hypercoagulability, I think in a young patient, I favor some kind of inherited risk or some kind of you know, congenital risk for pulmonary um, embolism. Meaning I favor something like antiphospholipid syndrome, Usually factor V Leiden, prothrombin gene mutation, antithrombin 3 deficiency, they're not enough of a hit to cause severe PE, but I would entertain that possibility. But the main one you need to consider in this patient would be APLS. So we need to look at the PTT, which is usually elevated in such patients with APLS. And I would send you know, the beta-2 glycoprotein, the cardiolipin, the lupus anticoagulant in this patient. Um, but I, I, but Sammy, before we continue, let me just pass the mic to Robbie for the workup, like looking at one of your schemas, Robbie, besides your uh, APLS workup in this 17 year old and maybe some of the mutations and factor deficiencies, anything else? And just know that the heparin can change the results of some of the, the, the data here, not mutation tests, but some, and not antibodies, but some of the other data that are measuring time. Um, I think that, you know, uh, uh, one, I think, you know, one of the things that I'm loving when I sit back here and listen to Reza teach is the focus on management reasoning. And that was such a great breakdown of, of the management reasoning in a pulmonary embolism. Um, I really, really learned a lot from that conversation. And I, um, I have to admit that the, my, my, my um, grasp of the uh, workup for, psych for pulmonary embolism is so tricky because you don't see it consistently applied. You know, like when you're trying to learn something, uh, uh, you, what, what helps is when everybody does the same thing, but so many people do so many different things for the work of a pulmonary embolism that it's, it doesn't stick very well. Um, but I completely agree with Reza. I think that the fact that he is young may, mandates a secondary workup. I'm gonna share something with you and I'm, I'm kind of humbled about where it comes from. It comes from, um, uh, actually, uh, somebody near and dear to my heart who um, doesn't want to, uh, who actually sits very close to here, um, who also plays disc golf. Um, let me show you what disc golf looks like. Disc golf, if you don't know it, you have to have your elbow like this, and you're like throwing things. Um, which is, that's a very poor, poor person's description of disc golf. So why is that relevant? In, in, if you walked into this room and you see a tall person, who has his spends a lot of his time with his arms above his shoulders, you should be very, very, very careful about a very morbid possibility. Um, and that possibility is thoracic outlet syndrome as a cause of a recurrent pulmonary emboli. The fact that his pulmonary artery is dilated makes me wonder that he, worry that he's had many of these before, maybe subclinical. And the one actionable thing I would do in addition to testing the um, the blood for um, things that are happening in the blood, like APLS and HIT, is to worry that he has compression of, um, you know, part of Virchow's triad is stasis. Does he have dynamic stasis of his um, veins in the upper extremity as a result of his recurrent activities playing American football and disc golf? So why do I know this? I know this because my colleague's best friend suffered extreme limb complications because of years of delayed diagnosis of thoracic outlet syndrome. So it might be something as simple as elevating this person's arms and seeing what happens to their, um, uh, to their pulses, to their neurological exam, and then maybe even um, considering to doing something unusual, 
which is to get um, uh, CT venography to see if he compresses his um, veins as he moves um, his hands above. The simple thing would be to re-examine the CT to see if he has any accessory ribs or tight um, inflow on the CT you already have. That is a no-miss cause in uh, a young adult. The equivalent in, a, in, um, in the legs is to look for May Thurner syndrome, which is compression of the iliac, left iliac vein. But here, I think the only, um, the analysis of secondary workup is look at, for stuff in the blood, as Reza outlined, um, <laughs> but also make sure that there's uh, no wall problems and wall problems on the venous side are usually compressive. So it's sim something very simple to do at the bedside and uh, a hypothesis that I might explore in somebody um, of this demographic. Great right. discussion. So his echocardiogram showed normal left ventricular function. Um, his right ventricular systolic pressure was 76. Um, he had RV dilatation and reduced pumping function. Um, a, a whole body CT was performed, which was basically normal. Um, he also had sonography of the arms and legs of the veins, which was also within normal limits. Um, APTT was 30, so normal. Um, INR was 1.1. Mm. For his rheumatologic workup, ANA was normal, anticardiolipin antibodies were not detectable, and also lupus anticoagulants was not detectable, so negative um, antiphospholipid syndrome workup. And I also have to plug something. The Curious Clinicians did a great episode, a recent on um, antiphospholipid syndrome. You have to listen to it. Um, yeah, for, for the thrombophilia workup, yeah, the whole genetic testing was negative. Protein C, protein S, antithrombin free, plasminogen, fibrinogen, homocysteine. Um, also genetic analysis for um, activated protein S deficiency and factor, or factor V Leiden and also pro-thrombin mutation were all negative. So the whole thrombophilia workup was negative. Um, yes, and that's it. And the next Eloquat will reveal the final diagnosis. It's always great news when the final diagnosis comes after a series of nothing, 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 nothing. Um, yeah, you know, I think um, I'll pass the mic to Prof. Raz because I think there's some um, uh, some very helpful things in general um, uh, with the workup of uh, PE. But I think if you think about clot quite simply, you think, um, is the source the blood or is the source the wall? And I think you're testing the blood very, very well. Um, so if you find anything, it's probably going to be in the wall. And um, I would just say, I would just normalize the notion that this is why a high rate of idiopathic unprovoked pulmonary embolism exists. It's not uncommon that the diagnostic journey ends with the next aliquot reveals that there is no diagnosis and this is the patient's situation. That's more common than what Sammy just said. And um, I worry that whenever we do that in medicine that we're missing things in general and maybe we'll learn about them 20 years from now or maybe we learned about them 20 years ago and just haven't diagnosed them today. Um, so I would just re-emphasize that in this person, you have to think about um, uh, dynamic compression of his vessels. And so that's the only actionable thing in this case. I'd say the probability of that being positive in general is very low. So you should do it because it's morbid, not because you expect it to be positive. Thoughts, Prof. Red? Man, I, I, I love just, Robbie, how you um, remember that, that component of the history. And probably you remembered it because you have that in your DDX for you know, thoracic outlet syndrome. If you don't have it in your DDX, then it's hard to activate that or even pay attention to that data point. And so why are we all here at VMR? I'm sure many of you like me didn't have that in, their, in your DDX. Now you do. 
So next week, if this shows up in, in the hospital, you're going to be ready. Your mind's going to be primed to view that data point as potentially um, the, the clue to the patient's answer. So I, I just wanted to maybe use my 20 seconds to say that um, parts of this sort of exercise is, yeah, showcasing what you know, but more importantly, identifying gaps that you can later then uh, approve improve your diagnostic skills. So very curious to hear from Sammy uh, how this case unfolds. Yeah, great discussion. I have a picture I can share for um, the last aliquot. So yeah, Ravi, you were totally on top of it. Um, here you see the multiple pulmonary embolisms, subsegmental and also segmental. And here on the right side, um, you can see an irregular of the right subclavian vein, um, which was considered the source of this repet repetitive spreading of thrombus into the lung. Um, yeah, I really like this case because I also didn't think about it. And my takeaway from this case is that when everything is negative, the patient is not inflamed, he has a negative thrombophilia workup, you should always think about anatomic causes as Robbie mentioned, Maturna syndrome, um, subclavian compression syndromes, um, myomes, um, I don't know how it's called in English. When you have in older women, you get uterus myomatosis, for example, it's gonna also compress the vena cava or some retroperitoneal lymphadenopathy, which can, as Robbie said, um, cause stasis and lead to subsequent thrombus formation. Yeah, it was a great discussion. Thank you, guys. Sammy, I love it when you bring these cases to us. I, I think we'll learn a lot um, from them. And I think your summary pearl is just so on point, you know, um, that, that um, you know, think about it. I, I think, honestly, in my opinion, if I were taking care of this patient in real life, I'd give myself a 70% chance of diagnosing him with idiopathic hypercoagulability of unclear cause and 30% um, being in VMR mode in real life and catching it. Um, the truth, most of us when we're taking care of patients in real life are not in VMR mode. There's too much going on, like the note, the discharge summary, the orders, the phone calls, the pages. Um, so I really, uh, but as Reza said, um, you, the goal is to translate your skills to the point where you don't need VMR mode to think about these things where you've been exposed so much that they become routine. And I think the way you summarized it helps that, but like there's no inflammation think anatomic that's so actionable. And I'll just emphasize one thing to, for, for everyone who's learning about this, um, as I am relearning about it, is there's this, the CT that you're showing us or the imaging that you're showing us is very unique. So pay attention to the clavicles, folks. This is not just some regular old CT. This is a dynamic CT where the clavicles are like this. So if you just got a regular old imaging with the patients like this, you may not see the compression. So you have to have the CT be dynamic where you compare the patient's outflow like this and then do this. So um, we recently learned of a, a neurological condition where you have to do dynamic flexion and extension MRIs to see compression on the spinal cord. So um, just to hammer home the point that this requires dynamic CT, one where you're like this, and then the other like this to be able to um, catch the image. And, and Sammy, before I pass the mic to um, Andrea to take us home, just want to thank you as always for bringing such educational cases and also presenting it in like, in a very special way. Like it just lends itself to an incredible, you're like, I don't know how to say that thing with this. And then you went on from, the, from that point. So a subtle hint there, but thanks again. You, you made me smarter today and I'm sure you've made many of our colleagues smarter and better for tomorrow. Thank you, Sammy. Uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna talk about the teaching points. Uh, when we have a young patient, uh, what we presume is that they have no prior medical story. Uh, and because that patient had a rapid onset of symptoms, we talk about perforation, obstruction, allergic reaction, or dissection. Because the patient had pleuritic pain, we talk about pulmonary embolism, the four piece, pulmonary embolism, pericarditis, pleuritis, and pneumonia. Um, and something uh, that we get a lot in the standardized test. Uh, orthopnea is not, 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 it's not always a heart disease. It can be also uh, a pulmonary disease or, or chronic artery disease. 
and um, because the patient had dry calf, um, a farm, it could be Brucella or Coachella. Um, the patient had weight loss, dyspnea, or tonia. So that makes us, us think about inflammatory chest syndrome. Uh, pulmonary dilatation uh, can cause critical by compression. Um, and we have this pair that massive pulmonary embolism can cause significant QT prolongation and T way inversion. There is a chronic dyspnea and normal hemoglobin, so with that support pre-pulmonary diagnosis. Pulmonary embolism is stratified between ma massive to massive in intermediate versus other. Uh, it is high risk if the patient is hypotensive. With intermediate risk, you have to look for troponins. Um, and pulmonary thrombolysis embolis, trom uh, treatment is with uh, systemic or local thrombolytic treatment. Like in this patient, and something I have never heard before was that this golf. I didn't know that sport existed, but it's like when you use your arms to throw something, and because this patient had uh, liked this sport, uh, and it can be a tall person. And we talk about thoracic outlet syndrome with recurring emboli. And I learned that you can also use dynamic CT to see. Uh, uh, to localize a compression. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrea. That was fabulous. Hope you stay warm there. Take care, everyone. <laughs>